Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's chess webinar using biomarker based risk assessment to inform lung nodule referral decisions. My name is Robbie Lunt, and I am the Director of Marketing for Biodesics. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Susan Garwood. Dr. Garwood completed her internal medicine training at Vanderbilt University and her pulmonary and critical care training at the Medical University of South Carolina. She practices advanced bronchoscopy at Centennial Thoracic Surgical Associates in Nashville, Tennessee, and serves as the Thoracic Oncology Medical Director in the HDA TriStar Health Division, and as the National Physician Director for the Pulmonary Service Line for the HDA Enterprise. In today's presentation, Dr. Garwood will discuss the challenges and benefits of identifying small malignant lung nodules. She will also discuss the importance of risk assessment and how determining the probability of lung cancer can be used to inform re referral decisions for patients with lung nodules that are identified at various points of care in the healthcare system. There will be plenty of time at the end of the presentation for Q&A, so please use the Q&A box to enter your questions at any point throughout the presentation. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Garwood. Thank you so much, Robbie, and uh, hello to you all. We really appreciate you joining us this afternoon. I want to specifically thank Chess for allowing us to participate um, in this uh, presentation and also for Biodesics for sponsoring. So, um, like I've said many times, this topic is near and dear to my heart. Um, I really appreciate all of you who've committed the time uh, to, to listen to our talk today. So, for the rest of today, we're going to be reviewing a multitude of things with uh, regards to pulmonary nodule. First, really want to establish the landscape. So where is the scope of the problem? We also want to talk about the importance of identifying malignant nodules specifically, as that really is the heart of the matter. One of my um, great advisors once told me trying to, to sift through these nodules is trying to, to boil the ocean. So the question today is, as a pulmonary community, can we boil the ocean to find the specks of salt that represent malignant lung cancer? I hope when you leave today that you will have a call to action that we really do have tools that will allow us to find those cancers in a vast sea of nodules. We want to look at current guidelines for lung nodule management and how this may affect your daily practice. And in the end, we want to leave you with a great ability to stratify lung nodules using biomarker-based risk assessment. So let's start with what the challenges are with nodule discovery. And as I mentioned earlier, the challenge is that there is a vast ocean of nodules. I think our best paper um, was written by Dr. was written by Gould. Um, the interesting thing about this paper, as I reviewed, is that this literature is now almost 10 years old. Um, we look specifically over a six-year time frame in the Kaiser system in California. Um, that six-year time frame began in 2006. So I'm um, even more than 10 years old. The scope of the problem at that time, um, when they looked at this large IDN, which is an integrated delivery network, they found that over 200,000 of, um, uh, of their patients actually had at least one dedicated CT of the chest. And of those, 68,000 had a nodule noted on CT. That's 31% of those patients had a nodule size 4 to 30 millimeters. If you extrapolate that over the U.S. population, you see that that's 1.6 million new nodules in the U.S. per year. Now, remember, this is dedicated chest CT only, and also the data, though this was published in 2015, now um, is getting, um, getting older. So what does radiology look like in regards to chest imaging currently? We look at this paper, uh, the next paper, shows um, that... It, published in JAMA in 2019, that the vast sea of nodules is not changing because the imaging rate is continuing to increase. This looks compared to 2000 compared to 2016. So over that time frame that Gould published, you can see that of all adults, CT imaging continues to sharply climb. And in older adults, those are over 65, certainly a peak. And again, this is CT chest imaging only. This does not look at any other incidental findings where you may actually have a field of view of the chest, like a CT abdomen or a head and neck. Um, so certainly multiple ways that you can find incidental nodules other than plain CT chest alone. But it clearly gives you an idea that this vast sea of nodules is really ripe for the picking. Next slide. So 
what happens when the nodules are found? And again, this is another look into a commercial insured group of medical claims. And this shows a very frightening statistic, I hope that we would all take back, that over 60% of the time, these nodules are not followed up upon. Um, the question is, why is that? Now, every nodule that we see, especially if it's small or calcified or previously stable, won't need follow-up. But if you begin to look through these, older patients, smokers, um, male and female, you see that though female and smoker and older age do better, across the time frame here and across these uh, different demographic forms, no workup overall was 64%. So we find a vast sea of nodules and currently in our current state over 60% of the time, we miss an opportunity to at least assess whether they need any additional workup, even if that is only a CT follow-up. Next slide. So if our goal is to go through this ocean um, of pulmonary nodules and pick out the malignant ones, why do we feel like this is an important thing to do? So the first thing to understand is if we're talking about malignant lung cancer, the one thing that we do know is that lung cancer kills. If you look at the Kaplan-Meier curve, again, whenever I went through training, um, the TNM stage, the seventh edition, looked at um, all stages of lung cancer really by 1A was considered anything smaller than three centimeters. And if you look at the survival curves, number one, just look at the bottom and see that late stage lung cancer kills. But if you look closer to the stop where stage 1A, 1B, and 2A are early stage lung cancer are seen, you see that there isn't a lot of variability between those stages. So survival, again, also doesn't look great in that specific population. And the question was at that point, are there certain factors that made survivability more likely in early stage disease? So they went back to the drawing board, looked through the SEER registry, and began to formulate what we now consider the eighth edition of the TNM lung cancer staging. And something very interesting happened. If we look at this slide, you see that there is a distinct jump in survivability in specifically those labeled stage 1A1. And those actually are those that have lung cancer found smaller than one centimeter. And that is a huge difference. The question is, do we have an opportunity to find those cancers? That's what we want to find out today. How do we actually pluck those cancers out? And this is multifaceted. First, we have to be able to find them on CT. Second, we need to direct them to an appropriate course of evaluation. Third, we need to risk stratify those that need evaluation and don't. And fourth, and maybe more importantly, we need to steer them to the right referral practice where they can get ideally the right biopsy the first time to get an answer and move on to a treatable stage 1A1 lung cancer. So what does this look like in real time? And I think to me, this is very telling. If you look to the right, Detterback showed us uh, a, a size description. And what we're talking about is really trying to find lung cancer the size of a centimeter, which is about the size of a Cheerio. As you increase, every centimeter matters. And that's what I want you to take away today. Every time we do inappropriate watchful waiting, this is the risk. Look at the survival decline with no nodal involvement over a centimeter incremental growth. And the question is, well, gosh, man, if we found them at this small size, how would we know who to act on? And when I went through training, again, if you look at traditional bronchoscopy, traditional bronchoscopy for those two centimeters or smaller was abysmal. So only 14% chance that those of us who practice bronchoscopy as a profession would be able to get answers. We know now that even in those with, sub, with small lesions, specifically three centimeters and smaller that we're talking about, even one centimeter and smaller, that advances in peripheral navigation make this a possibility. That includes robotics, that includes advanced imaging, augmented pleuroscopy, cone beam CT, you name it, the industry is trying to find a widget in order to biopsy and diagnose these cancers at a small stage, which goes back to the beginning of the conversation. We must refer to advanced bronchoscopists in order to get the diagnosis. So that begins our conversation. Next slide. When do you refer? 
part of my motivation today is really to almost to light a fire under our pulmonary community. And one of the ways I think about this and talk to my primary care physicians is how certain are you that your follow-up scan in 12 months is going to be enough? Now, we don't have great literature about doubling times of cancer. Um, ideally, if you think it's cancer, it should be going to treatment. So we don't watch cancers to see how long it takes for them to double. But what we do know is listed here in this 2015 paper that doubling times for indolent cancers and early, um, early stage lung cancers can be very broad, anywhere from one and a half months doubling time up to a year's time. So three to 12 months in those publications is considered the average doubling time. My question to you today is how long are you willing to watch a nodule knowing that every centimeter it grows you have a substantial survival decline. So having some idea about how to talk to your primary care physicians about the importance of early referral, not every referral is going to need a biopsy. What we must as a community decide about is how do we get the referrals in? How do we educate providers about appropriate risk stratification? And when do we act? But knowing doubling times, I think is an important part for our education to primary physicians. Next slide. So when we do get referred, the other thing that we must show our referrers is that we're acting responsibly. Now, if you refer to a surgeon or you refer to a diagnostic specialist like myself or to interventional radiology, if you send it to me um, for a procedure, most of the time I'm going to perform a procedure because that's what you asked me to do. The question is, is that the right thing to do? As a pulmonary community, it's very important, just because we are diagnosticians does not mean that every patient needs to have a diagnostic biopsy. Why is that? We can overact. This paper by Tanner shows that 62% of the time, all of the biopsies that were done um, bronchoscopically or surgically were done on benign disease. Those who went straight to surgery, 35% of the time, surgery was performed on benign disease. So we need to show our referring providers, not only are we safe to follow your patients, we are going to use better risk stratification to know when to act. Now, risk stratification is not something that we talk about routinely. Um, it's not something that I see in a lot of my fellow general um, pulmonology notes and records, but it's very important as we begin to think about the algorithm for patient management, risk stratification. Next slide. So the first thing we do is go to the guidelines. And if you see, this is our, our tried and true eight to 30 millimeter solitary pulmonary nodule guidelines from chest. If you look at the top, the first thing it asks us to do is to assess clinical probability. Now that can be the physician's gut probability, that can be a probability based on the calculator, but there are very, very clear dividing lines to the left and the right. To the left on very low risk patients, CT surveillance is the norm. To the right with high risk patients, it says we should act. That would include staging, PET, and often moving on to surgical resection if there's no evidence of advanced stage disease. The middle group is what I wanna draw your attention to. These are the low to moderate risk patients. The first thing it asks us to do is to order a PET scan. If it's greater than eight millimeters, this is guideline approved. The question is, is a physician assessment and a PET enough for us to make the appropriate decision? As this shows, if the PET is moderate or intense, we should try a non-surgical biopsy in order to make an answer and a diagnosis, or we can move on to surgical resection. But if it's negative or it's mild, it points us towards CT surveillance or says perhaps you should do a biopsy. So there is a lot of gray in this middle group. Next slide. Same thing with Fleischner. If we look at our Fleischner group, it defines risk there at the bottom. Low risk is anyone less than 5% probability of cancer with whatever model that you choose. And high risk is basically everybody else. So Fleischner is basically saying, if it is very low risk, we know that CT surveillance is, um, is okay. Um, these are very um, clear and very smaller nodules. There's an optional CT scan if the patient is high risk with a smaller than six millimeter nodule. But it is clearly showing that anything that is greater than 5% risk needs some type 
of CT surveillance, and we've already shown you that over 60% of the time that just doesn't happen. If you look to the far right, however, in our eight millimeter or greater, it gives you three options. You can CT at three months, which looking at doubling times may or may not be appropriate. You can do a PET scan, which we know sensitivity and specificity is not perfect, or you can tissue sample. What is the risk of missing the appropriate choice? Next slide. So when you try to talk about risk assessment, I think it's important that you use a risk stratifier um, and a risk calculator based on the intended group. So we specifically, with the rest of this talk, are going to be focusing on the Mayo nodule calculator. And again, all of our calculators use standard things that should be readily available, like the patient's age, smoking history, location, nodule size, um, prior history of cancer. The reason this specific test chose the Mayo nodule calculator, which is also known as Swenson, we can use those interchangeably, is that the probability of cancer in that population was around 23%. 23% is the rate of pre cancer prevalence that we anticipate and see in true incidental nodules. If you look down to the bottom, um, just a couple lower, on BRAC, you see that BRAC is actually used in a screening population where you are screening people with very high risk, and that incidence of cancer is far lower at 5%. So if you're running an incidental nodule clinic, specifically if you're using the um, risk stratifier we're about to talk about. From here, moving forward, we'll be talking about Mayo. If you are using a screening population, it may be more appropriate to use BRAC, but the point today is use a risk calculator so that you actually know how to move forward. Next slide. So if you break it all down, um, and again, one thing we didn't mention is that of all the nodules, we know our screening population is vastly underserved right now. We are really screening in this country only about 6% of those who qualify. With new recommendations suggesting we can lower the age and lower the pack years, that anticipated patient population that will be available for screening is expected to double. That is not yet improved by insurers, but the screening population, unfortunately, is a very small piece of the ocean of nodules that we have right now. So currently, 95% of nodules are found incidentally. If you look at the patient's clinical chart and you add in the factors for Mayo and you get a risk stratification, to me, this is the most important slide. 72% of the time, the patient is in the low to moderate risk group where that follow-up really is directed by their pulmonologist or treating physician. If they are very low risk or less than 5%, CT surveillance from the beginning with just a risk calculator alone is appropriate, but that only represents 2% of our patient population. For those in high risk, again, the number is higher, but that's 26% of people who should have a clear path forward to say biopsy and evaluations needed. For the rest of today, we will focus on the gray zone as I talk about what is a path forward in a low to moderate risk patient. Next slide. So if we think about assessment, the question is, how good are we at determining benign for malignant nodules? And to orient you here, again, this is Silvestri's um, paper along with Nicole Tanner. They've done a great job at looking at cancer probability and how good we are at assessing benign nodules. Along the bottom is specificity and to the left is sensitivity. So what we want is a high negative predictive value test that tells me when not to act. And you will see that in the green dots that are highlighted at the top. If we start from top to bottom, the integrated classifier that we are going to describe today has a very high negative predictive value. Again, if we look at the difference between it and a physician calculated risk, we see that for the first time, we have a test that outperforms the physician. It outperforms the physician, it outperforms the Mayo nodule calculator. It outperforms PET. Specifically, we are looking at those that are in the low, less than 50% pretest probability of cancer, the gray zone. All of us are good at looking at a large tumor and saying that looks like cancer it needs to be acted upon. We're specifically talking about the smaller nodules where when to act is very unclear. The dashed line that goes through the um, uh, transversely through that uh, is really the 
coin toss, basically. If your test is below that, it really means that you're actually worse than a coin toss. If you look at the VA model line, which is in yellow, as you move farther to the right, actually, the predictability of the VA model um, actually gets worse because those patients had such a high prevalence of cancer. But what this clearly shows is for the first time, we have a classifier that outperforms the physician and outperforms what we would consider our best model in our incidental nodule population. The question is, what do we do with this information? Next slide. So, where does blood-based biomarker testing come in to the equation, specifically in these indeterminate markers? What the company did was actually take on the intended use group, which you will see on our next slide. The intended use group, um, I'm sorry, let me back up just a little bit. The blood-based testing strategy actually has two parts. One is the Notify CDT, which is a rule-in test. It has a 98% specificity uh, for lung cancer and a 78% positive predictive value which means four out of the five times, if you have a positive or high result on CDT, it actually does represent lung cancer. To the contrary, Notify XL2 is a blood-based assay that helps identify likely benign nodules. Again, high sensitivity, high negative predictive value, covered by insurance, and now peer-reviewed and moving forward with multiple publications. And so we're gonna walk through this today about how these two tests can help us in nodule evaluation. Next slide. The first is to make sure we're using the test appropriately. So the validation of this test was done in the panoptic trial um, by Dr. Silvestri, one of my, my prior mentors at MUSC um, and aided by Tanner and company. Specifically, we're looking at those in the gray zone in the eight to 30 millimeter uh, size range. The patient's age must be 40 or greater and their calculated risk of malignancy needs to be less than 65%. Those who've had a prior cancer, if you've had lung cancer, again, this is not the test for you. If you have had a previous malignancy, it has to be more than five years, even if it is a, um, you know, an early stage cancer, an early stage colon cancer, an early stage breast cancer, all of those things must be more than five years for this test to be actually validated. If you're only looking at the rule out test XL2, then the pretest probability of malignancy that's appropriate for this test is those with pretest calculated risk of 50% or less. Next slide. So the Notify XL2 test is, is um, really utilizing our five major clinical risk factors that we saw in Mayo, specifically location, speculation, smoking history, age and nodule size. It then combines these proteomic elements. The first is the LG3BP, and that is, a, um, that is a protein that appears to be elevated in blood levels in patients with lung cancer. To the contrary, we're looking at C163A, and that is a, um, a protein that is shed from macrophages during inflammation. And it specifically looks at your patient's bloodstream to look at the ratio of those two components, cancer drivers, inflammatory drivers, to see if we can add information to your patient's risk stratification. And if you look back to the left, um, you see that the patient's nodule size is 30% predictive of if they're a risk for cancer. But these plasma protein levels are equally weighted to the nodule size. And I find that really most, um, most useful. Um, as I look at a growth, obviously, the larger something is, the more likely it's worrisome. If I had a, compl uh, if I had a complementary test that actually um, looked at nodule size just the same, I think that would be extremely useful. So that's exactly what this Notify XL2 test does. Next slide. So when Panoptic was um, presented, the initial study showed that 41% of the time, um, you were able to reclassify that indeterminate nodule to a very low risk patient where serial CT surveillance was appropriate. So remember, if 70% of the time our patients are indeterminate, we could add a test on top of that, that 40% of the time would tell us exactly how to act and that not acting with the biopsy is appropriate and that CT surveillance was appropriate. That is what the panoptic trial showed. We wanted to further look into that and they performed a cohort study 
uh, of clinical use. This is post-market analysis of 1,000 patients, and the exact same thing occurred. 43% of the time, those indeterminate nodules could be reclassified, telling us that serial surveillance and not a biopsy was most appropriate with those patients. And I find that very impactful. Next slide. The CDT test actually is looking at the opposite. This is actually measuring autoantibodies uh, to tumor-associated antigens that help you detect lung cancer. These antigens were picked out, these um, antibodies were picked out over all histology stages and all stages of lung cancer. Very specific, um, but the positive predictive value is not perfect. Again, the goal is to find if you should act by finding a positive autoantibody that pushes you above that 65% risk mark, or do you not act when the calculated risk post-notify is less than 5%. So this actually is helping us identify likely malignant nodules. It's not a 100% malignant, but again, is a better guide than physician acumen alone. Next slide. So what does the report actually look like? This gives you the notify CDT test. Currently, this is done reflexively. So the first test that is ordered is the CDT test to see if any antibodies are present. You will either have a three version, no antibodies are present, a moderate level of antibodies are present, or a high level of antibodies are present. If you look to the middle graph, it says pretest information, and that's specific to those five Mayo calculators. So you've given the age, the size, the speculation, the location, and any smoking history. And this patient's calculated risk was 12% prior to notify. After running the CDT test, a high level of autoantibodies were seen, pushing this patient's risk to 66% telling you, you now had a personalized risk assessment suggesting that intervention at this point is warranted. Very helpful. Next slide. The Notify XL2 looks very similar. In this patient, actually, when you calculated the pretest probability of malignancy, it was 40%. And after the test, and it looks again at the combination of um, markers in the blood, of cancer drivers and inflammatory markers, it showed that post-notify that the risk of malignancy was reduced to 4%, meaning serial surveillance and no biopsy was warranted at this current time. Next slide. So if we put all this together, reclassifying the risk of malignancy first starts with a risk, with a risk calculator. So we, at least as a pulmonology group, have to make that part of our standard practice. We then look to guidelines we then look to see if we added a biomarker, could this help? So if you look at Notify CDT, if it identifies patients greater than 65% risk of malignancy, this would push us over to biopsy either surgically or non-surgically, again, after the appropriate staging is done. If the, nodule, if the CDT is negative and the pretested risk of malignancy is less than 50%, XL2 can then be performed. Again, it can stratify you to the lowest risk group where CT is appropriate, or if you are in the indeterminate or it doesn't change your risk, again, you are still left with the same information and you need to proceed with guideline appropriate or Fleischner guideline appropriate serial surveillance or biopsy based on your PET and clinical acumen. Next slide. So when we looked at this, um, Panoptic, like I said, was able to reclassify those with malignancy a little over 40%. But Panoptic showed that the XL2 test alone still missed about 3% of malignant nodules. The question was, when CDT was added, would this make any advantage? And this is a poster that was presented at CHEST um, showing that when you applied the Notify CDT to that Panoptic population, those that were CDT positive, that was 11% of those, it actually pulled out those that were the malignant nodules so that after we applied CDT followed by XL2, if you look to the bottom, you see that 100% of the time, the benign nodules were truly benign at two-year follow-up. If this had been applied, there were also another 15% of patients that would have avoided a biopsy. So we've done two things. We've put the appropriate patient into serial surveillance, and we've avoided 
missing malignant nodules by doing this in a reflexive layered manner, CDT first, followed by XL2. So this shows the power of actually adding biomarker testing into your risk stratification. Again, with all literature, this is ongoing. We are looking to have additional clinical trials, cohort use cases, looking at this reflexive nature together. You look at the sample sizes here and they are small. So there is more to come. So what does this actually look like in practice? Next slide. So this is my entire life, okay? All I do is look at nodules all day long. And so I'm faced with these decisions when to act and when not to act. And remember, my whole job is to do bronchoscopy for my hospital. So me seeing all these patients and not doing bronchoscopy is, um, is, is really something that will catch people's attention. So my job as a bronchoscopist and a nodule manager is when I do get nodule referrals is to show responsible handling. This is an example when this test first came into our clinic. This is a 57-year-old male, and he presented to our emergency room with atypical chest pain. And much like all of our ERs do, if people come in with chest pain, they often get CT scans of their chest. As we showed, CT imaging continues to climb across the country. <coughs> this patient had a CTA, and if you look, you will see that he's got a speculated cavitary nodule in the top of his left lung. This patient actually came to my attention because within our HCA system, we really think that incidental nodule management is something that requires a very intricate care coordination. We actually have a system that overreads all of our CT imaging that includes any lung field in the chest, and it looks for things that are six millimeters or greater. It looks for things that are non-stable, non-calcified, and it puts it into a queue. That cue is reviewed every day by our nodule coordinator. If the patient meets criteria, and this is truly an incidental nodule, meaning no one knew about it before, it's not followed by a pulmonologist, it's not followed by an oncologist for a known malignancy, if it appears to be untouched by anyone, it comes into a cue that then I review as a nodule clinic. And we do this all across our HC enterprise, um, and it's been wildly successful. But this is an example of that. This patient was picked up by the nodule coordinator, and if you look at his risk factors, again, this looks very concerning. He's got a greater than one centimeter nodule. He is a current everyday smoker of a pack and a half per day. He's smoked for a number of years, and he has a lot of other comorbid risk factors. So the first thing we do as part of our standard, um, standard guideline workup was to order a PET scan. Next slide. So the patient was seen in nodule clinic and had the risk assessment done with the risk calculator with Mayo, which showed his pretest probability of malignancy was 45%. Again, that's in the indeterminate gray zone. <clears throat> so we ordered the PET scan, and the PET scan was maybe helpful. The PET scan showed an SUV of 3.2. So again, in the indeterminate range, but enough to get your attention in a high-risk patient. So the question was, where do we go from here? Notify was ordered, and if we move to the next slide, you will see that the patient had no evidence. I think we just lost our light here. The patient had no evidence of, go back again. Next slide, Robbie. The patient had no significant level of autoantibodies detected, so XL2 was performed, and it showed that his post-test probability of malignancy was reduced from 45% to 5%. So this suggested that not acting was the thing to do. Now I can tell you this patient was seen in a procedure person's office myself. My office is also connected with our thoracic surgeon who is, sits right beside me. And so we had to have a discussion. Do we act or do we not? Um, the patient at this point has read enough of the literature, next slide, and said his anxiety level, he's certain that this is cancer. He's, you know, again, appreciative of the, of the blood test but the surgeon agreed to operate due to the patient's anxiety. And indeed, when this was resected, it was not cancer. This was a granuloma, showing that the test actually did what was appropriate. Our desire to act on these nodules also has to be reined in. We have to grow increasing confidence in the ability to have biomarkers guide us through this workup process. And I also am living through this, but this case is a couple of years old. 
Um, and it really has been a good point for me to be able to show that it's changed my management. A chance to cut is not always a chance to cure, and we have to be mindful of the same thing with biopsy. Given that 60% number um, of biopsies being done on benign nodules, we have to show our referring physicians that the ability to make responsible decisions for their patients is important. We also, as a pulmonary group, need to move forward one slide, Bobby, Robbie, need to decide when to make that referral. I would encourage all of you, as you think about the size of nodules that we've talked about, what we're asking you to consider intervening upon, it's very important that when you get this information, one, we show responsible handling, when to survey, and when to biopsy. When to biopsy also needs to be considered. Within your market, do you know where the best peripheral navigation and endobronchial ultrasound can be done? If you don't, you need to explore that. If you haven't had conversations with your primary care physicians about the appropriateness of when to refer, and maybe even how this test can help them risk stratify, then we need to do that. If you aren't looking at your own practice for when incidental nodules are found within your institution, in your ER, in your inpatient, in your outpatient imaging, know from the volume that we showed at the very beginning, over 2 million plus at this point are being found incidentally. We have a tremendous opportunity. And every time we find a lung cancer that is small in size, we have a tremendous opportunity to impact lives, save lives every day. We must be informed. We must have a clear path forward. I hope that you found the information today helpful, um, and I'm happy to entertain any questions. Thank you to uh, all of you for your participation. Thank you so much, Dr. Garwood. Um, and a quick reminder to the audience, if you do have any questions, please enter them into the question and answer box uh, that's in the Zoom. Um, maybe to kick things off, Dr. Garwood, I have a question for you myself. So at the beginning, you talked about the, the concerning statistics of patients with lung nodules that aren't followed up on. For a patient with a small malignant nodule, what might be the implications of that if they don't get that prompt uh, clinical workup? Yeah, I think that's very important. And hopefully the, the most um, telling slide will be that if you don't work up lung nodules when they are small in size, specifically three centimeters and smaller, advancing lung cancer stage leads to advancing death. So the ability to find lung cancers before there is nodal involvement allows us to have a five-year survival 75% uh, or greater. And if you're finding lung cancer that is advanced stage, again, we're talking about 5% survival in stage four disease. Again, this is changing with immunotherapy and chemotherapy, but every time you watch and let these grow by more than a centimeter, you see that you're losing substantial survivability. So a chance to act when they're early is everything that we're asking. We just need to have a smarter way to find out when to proceed with evaluation. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, a question from the audience here is regarding molecular diagnostics. Do you think that they will be included in the NCCN guidelines? So if you're talking about um, molecular testing for these, we've certainly learned a lot um, about when to use moleculars in early stage disease. I think the NCCN guidelines clearly show that in advanced stage disease, stage 3B and stage 4, that a, a next generation or expanded genomic sequencing of that patient is very important because we can match patients to appropriate targeted therapy. We can match them to appropriate immunotherapy. The question is, when it's early stage, does molecular makeup matter? And the answer is absolutely yes. And recent literature has shown specifically in those that are EGFR positive that are early stage disease, even if you're a stage one patient, that knowing that EGFR status can match you to targeted therapy and have substantial outcome differences. Um, so specific to that, um, EGFR currently is already being looked at, I believe um, that this pipeline will continue to increase, which means that sampling will become even more important. So if you are an advanced bronchoscopist out there, I think that our uh, longevity for our career um, has continued to grow because of the need. What we don't want is to have to have repeated biopsies to get appropriate sample size for molecular testing. 
So I would caution you, if you do go into this road, even if you're in early stage disease, making sure you have robust sampling so we can do molecular testing when it's appropriate is a very important part of this. Thank you for that again, Dr. Garwood. Um, another question is, do you think that the tests can be used in areas where there's a high incidence of other infections like tuberculosis or histoplasmosis? Well, I, I would say that uh, absolutely yes. I am in the heart of the histo belt here in Middle Tennessee. And so that I think really highlights the importance, um, specifically the patient that I showed you, because um, fungal infections, any type of inflammatory infectious process could be false positive on PET. Our current guidelines only give us the patient's uh, risk factor um, and then that PET in order to make a path forward. If you have a PET positive lesion, especially if you're in an endemic area uh, like myself or if you have an area where TB is prevalent, our tendency to act is going to be higher because when we pet those patients, the likelihood of a false positive is going to be there. This really puts us at an advantage being able to look at cancer drivers versus inflammatory markers really, as it was highlighted in that, that patient that I showed, can help you risk stratify. So I think it's absolutely um, one of the more important things that we can do in that demographic area. So a slightly different question here about using the tests. Um, do you feel that having the general practitioners order notify lung prior to that patient being seen by you would be beneficial? Well, it depends on your referral pattern. So I think if you are not getting um, nodule referrals from your primary care physicians, if you look at the number of nodules that you're seeing, um, I think that that's important to go and educate them. Often when I talk to my primary care population, they say they're perfectly capable of reading a Feichner guideline and reading that CT and finding out when the appropriate follow-up should be done. Unfortunately, we know that about 60% of the time that follow-up CT scan over the two-year time frame is not done. So being referred to a nodule clinic, we know increases compliance with CT, lung, with CT surveillance. But if you talk to them and say, if you don't want to refer, at least add this to your clinical algorithm so that when you do find those patients that are indeterminate and specifically high risk, please refer. So it is a way to get your foot in the door for a new discussion with primary care groups, whether that's internal medicine, whether that's hospitalists, whether that's family practice. But this test will allow you to go in with a new conversation. If you don't get the referrals, we don't have an opportunity to find those cancers. And we really need to impress upon our medical community how drastic the survivability is when we find lung cancer smaller than three centimeters and even smaller than a centimeter. So use this to get your foot back in the door. If they do want to use the test, make sure you come alongside, do CMEs, help them do responsible handling and understand the appropriate clinical algorithm. But either way, if they are anything less than 5%, CT surveillance is okay. But again, all others ideally need to come to a specialty clinic where they could get advanced diagnostics if needed. So switching gears again a little bit back to the clinical data, has there been a clinical utility study with histological truth? So I would say the clinical cohort, so th this is a question I asked too, right? So if you're looking at the panoptic trial, I mean, you're looking at the cohort study again, um, the panoptic trial, again, looked at those uh, who truly had malignancy over that time frame. And again, those were patients who had pathologic malignant diagnoses. The CT surveillance after, it was considered benign on CT if there was no growth or it shrank at the two-year interval. So we did not biopsy all of those nodules. So we do not have histologic proof, as you would say, on every nodule, but we do have radiographic follow-up um, on both studies, both the panoptic trial we showed, the cohort trial, um, and the, um, the retrospective uh, review uh, with panoptic to add CDT. So as we look forward, I think this is part of working with industry and also something that, that we are working on at HCA. As we use the test, I think it's important for us all as a pulmonary community to establish that truth. 
if we're using the test, how do we look in a registry fashion to say what truly happened to that patient over that two-year time frame? How many of these less than 5% were truly benign at two years? If you did have a CDT positive, um, was that 78% positive predicted value? Did that weigh out? We need more data. We need more numbers. But that requires us as users to really participate and, and partner uh, with folks like Biodesics and to publish places like Chess so that we can get that information out. So, yes, I think transparency with this data is important and following these patients serially with biomarker testing as an adjunct is extremely important. Thank you, Dr. Garwood. And I'll also just quickly add that there are two additional clinical studies ongoing looking at the Notify tests. Um, the first is the Oracle study, which is an observational clinical registry study, and then the Altitude study um, that just began in the last several months is a randomized control study as well. So if you have any interest in learning more about those studies, you can visit biodesics.com. Um, one last question, one last question that we have for you, unless anything else comes in from the audience, is about patients and reviewing test results with patients. So how do you discuss the test results with your patients? Yeah, that's a great question. And so I think that um, setting expectations before you even draw the blood is very important. Um, we review the test with the patient and, again, tell them that no test is perfect, but we review how accurate we are without the test and then what the literature suggests um, this information could add to their clinical decision making. One of the harder things, I think, is not the XL2 test, but the CDT test. So if you look at those results, if a patient does come back high, um, and it pushes them greater than 65%, it's still four out of five that that's a lung cancer um, when you actually drew the test. And so what we know is that they may actually have those factors circulating even four years before something can be radiographically seen. So super helpful. I can tell you the anxiety level of my patients when I call them and tell them that their risk has been re-stratified to less than 5%, their size of relief, People move on with their life and feel confident. Those that are intermediate, again, the conversation still goes very well, meaning that we're going to keep a close eye on you. We're going to follow the guidelines. Nothing has changed. If they are greater than 65%, that is an easy conversation for us to say is that the test is saying that a biopsy is appropriate at the present time, and they have confidence in moving forward. And I can tell you, I have patients with comorbidities um, that I might not have subjected to a biopsy had the test result not come back higher than 65%. Um, we've been able to get those patients through anesthesia, diagnose them with a 1A lung cancer, and get them onto SBRT. Um, so I think that setting expectations is important. If they do come back high on the CDT and they have a biopsy that's not cancer, you have to keep close surveillance on them because it may be in the next uh, few years after that that a small malignancy will show up and be radiographically detected. But you have to be able to speak to positive and negative predictive values in terms that your patients can understand. You have to let them know what you're going to do with the information, and you have to let them know what happens if they have a biopsy the steps that are coming after that. So those conversations I would hope would be ongoing throughout a nodule clinic already, but when you do a blood test, you specifically need to let them know and level set about how the path will be clear, clearer after. Thank you so much, Dr. Garwood. And with that, that will conclude our presentation today. So thank you everyone for uh, attending today and for your attention. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Garwood, for the informative presentation, and also a special thanks to Chest for hosting us today. Absolutely. So I hope everyone, I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thank you all.